my talk would be largely theoretical, the second part of the title. So I'll be doing largely pragmatics and for around 45 minutes and then Munojit will come in and do the first part of the talk. Uh, so uh, there, okay, so the usual thing, so there might be times when you see that I'm really going fast. If you have any questions, then you could come, you could raise your hand and ask or you could wait for the end of the talk to ask the question. So that's your choice. Okay, so these uh, are the major uh, stuff that I'll cover during this talk. Uh, so how do we, what do we mean by pragmatics? Uh, it's really a slippery slope right from the first part. So defining pragmatics has not been easy. It's <coughs> very controversial in linguistics and outside of linguistics. There are, there are hardly people who understand what do we mean by pragmatics. So they club together a lot of things and so, uh, and they'll call it pragmatics. Okay, the, uh, and then I'll cover some of the major uh, themes that have uh, been dealt with in the field. So that includes speech act th theory that I think most of you have heard of this, uh, at least uh, cooperative principles and implicature, uh, politeness theory and information structure. I'm not sure how many of you have uh, some idea about politeness and information, but other two are pretty, seems to be very common in computation. All right, so uh, let's start with a uh, uh, cartoon. So you'll see a couple, couple more of these stuff uh, <laughs> during the talk. And uh, so the idea is to look at those and destroy these cartoons. Right, so uh, it's, it's, it's pretty simple. And uh, we'll see what's uh, happening here, what happened towards the second half of the cartoon, right? Okay, so let's uh, uh, start from the beginning. So uh, pragmatics is generally from, you move from a structure to meaning and uh, what, whatever happens in between, uh, I would call that pragmatic. There are a lot of people who'd call that semantics uh, and there have been no good way of actually distinguishing between semantics and pragmatics and there are a strong semanticist and a strong pragmatist. Uh, for me, uh, so if you talk about uh, semantics, that's really a small part of pragmatics, the bigger thing. So say you have 10 options and you choose one of those and you say that's semantics of it. So any, utter uh, any utterance that you have, the meaning depend heavily on the pre-existing knowledge, uh, the assumed and or inferred intent of the speaker and a lot of other factors <coughs> which I cannot really list uh, those out. So. Uh, Generally and uh, most of the time or almost all, every time you speak, uh, the meaning is not derived just from the structure of the utterance. Uh, it's not composed of the lexical item. So it's not the meaning of an utterance. It's not the uh, combination of the meaning of individual lexical items. Right? So uh, it's not even, uh, it, it's not derived even out of the structural relations among those. So and a lot of times language in general is not just used to communicate facts, ideas, and opinions. That's how I see a lot of people defining language, but uh, that's one part of the language. That's not the whole of it, right? So pragmatics is all about modeling human interaction. How do you communicate and what all you do when you communicate or miscommunicate? Okay, so uh, one of the earlier uh, theories, this is not the earliest one, so, uh, but it's one of the earlier theories which tries to model this interaction. And I'd call this a macro perspective because it looks at the interaction from a very top level. So it, it doesn't really get minutely into it. Uh, it tries to typologize the whole uh, idea of uh, interaction. What do you do when you interact, when you speak? So there's a basic distinction that the theory makes between what's called constatives and performatives. So constatives are the one that you evaluate for its truth condition, uh, which uh, means, so if you have a sentence like, uh, MSR is a nice place to work in, but they will surely improve with some windows around. Uh, so uh, you could evaluate that uh, on the, so uh, uh, it's an opinion, right? It's not a canonical uh, fact. Thing. It's, it's, but it's still, you can evaluate this on the basis of certain facts. So 
uh, you could still argue about uh, the Windows thing. So do you have enough Windows or not? But performatives, on the other hand, they are probably not uh, truth uh, evaluable. And they actually perform the act uh, by saying those. So things like promises and legal judgments. So something like you are fired is you cannot really evaluate that by saying that's not true. So if your boss says that you are fired, then you are. Right? So uh, if you are declared uh, husband and wife. But these are the things that will work only in certain fixed contexts. So say if I come here and go to Monojit, and for some reason I'm very uh, very angry with him and say, you are fired, that, that won't mean anything, right? So it works only in certain fixed contexts. Right, so performatives, they are also called speech acts. Now, there have been a lot of uh, debate and theory, a lot of versions of this theory. So in one version of the theory, performatives uh, are also the speech acts. So they are the one and the same thing. And they can be analyzed at three different levels. So one is locutionary act, which is the performance uh, of an utterance, actual act of uttering. So uh, what a lot of people would call language. So when you are speaking, when you are producing the sounds, and you are putting it in a particular linguistic expression, and uh, you express your thoughts, that's uh, locution or locutionary act. Illocutionary act is what you actually mean. So. Uh, and there have been a lot of, the, it's a long list of illocutionary acts. The, the list that I'm giving you here is given by Searle, so there are only five illocutionary acts in his typology. But you'll find a lot of literature which does it much more than that. Right, the third and the last one is perlocutionary act, which is the real world effect of what you, are, what you have said. So uh, it can include a lot of things, so persuading, convincing, scaring, acting in a certain way. So if I say, please go and bring that chair, uh, that's the actual sentence would be the locution. Uh, uh, illocution would be request or one of the uh, five, you could take one of those five things and classify the illocution that I actually am requesting you to bring the chair. And per locutionary act may or may not happen. So uh, you may bring the chair or you may not. But uh, if you do bring the chair, then that's the per locutionary act. So as you'd see, we hardly deal with uh, the, this third thing in, uh, in linguistics. We are more concerned with uh, locution and illocution in different <coughs> areas of linguistics. So uh, there is uh, also something called indirect speech acts. Uh, so let's come back to this and uh, the third uh, slide, this one. So uh, we could call it uh, an indirect speech act because it's not really answering the question that has been put forth, right? So uh, it's not saying yes or no, uh, which is it's a yes no question clearly. So this is uh, some kind of an uh, indirect speech act and Searle suggests that we are able to derive meaning out of those indirect speech acts by means of a cooperative process. Now we'll come back to this uh, cooperative process, uh, out of which we are able to derive multiple illocutions. So we could uh, uh, derive more than one illocution so out of those. However, this uh, explanation within the speech act theory probably does not uh, account for a lot of things that happen in language. and it could be explained more adequately by resorting to context, uh, the idea of context. And that field is uh, generally called socio-pragmatics, where you take in pragmatics and also bring in the idea of context. So uh, a lot of people won't distinguish between socio-pragmatics and pragmatics. But uh, at a certain point of time, it's important to keep that distinction. OK, uh, how do we formalize it? Uh, Speech act theory uh, within linguistics, that's the most of the formalization that uh, people did. So they gave the types of speech acts. But uh, from very early on, so from early 1990s, people have been actually implementing speech act theory in building their chatbots and multi-agent systems and understanding what people are actually saying. So if somebody is speaking to your bot, and you got to understand if it's a request, if it's if it's just a statement of fact. So uh, people have been using uh, the theory to implement that uh, a lot. OK, so uh, 
we'll have more details about this in more this talk. Right, so let's come to the second uh, one and don't forget the first one because uh, <coughs> that will have relevance here also. So, so uh, th th this is not something which is very common, but if you if you have watched uh, things like Big Bang Theory, you'll find a lot of these examples there. So, <laughs> I forgot the name of the person, but uh, yeah, so one of the characters is Sheldon, right. So, uh, so it's not meant to be literal, but it's taken as literal. Now, how do we explain this, uh, what exactly is uh, happening here? So what do we mean when, we, when he says that maybe she wasn't asking? Now, uh, the ways we could explain uh, the things that happening, that's happening, that the weird thing that's happening there is using uh, cooperative principles. Uh, these were given by Grice in 1950s, and it's a way, it's, it's probably the beginning of what we call pragmatics today. So uh, it defines uh, how effective and successful communication is generally achieved in common social situation. It describes the assumption that speakers and the hearer had about each other while they are communicating. So uh, you think that what other person is saying or trying to say. And it also explains the link between utterances and what listeners infer or understand from them. So, uh, Let's see, uh, there are uh, four uh, maxims that uh, Grice proposes. Uh, <coughs> I won't really get into the detail of this because I assume that a lot of, if you don't know, then you could uh, just say that you don't know and I would come back to this. So uh, uh, the maxim of quality, uh, quantity, relation, and manner. So uh, these are the four uh, maxims that uh, Grice proposes, but these are not, uh, so if you read his paper, he says that these are just my suggestions of what could be the maxims, so th there are much, m there could be many more maxims. And the people have actually proposed many more maxims. The prominent uh, among them would be uh, maxim of politeness that Leach proposed, uh, and we'll come to that again, okay. So uh, in general, uh, uh, there have been a lot of uh, issues around cooperative principles and the idea of maxims. So uh, it's good to clear out what these are not. Uh, these are neither sociological generalizations about human communication. They don't uh, generalize that people talk in this way, right? So it's not, it's not description in that sense. Uh, nor is it any kind of prescription to be followed in a conversation. So there have been a lot of etiquette manuals, there have been books, how to communicate effectively, and they will quote Grice and say that you do this, you, do, do, you don't lie, and you, don't, you speak as much as is required, so all those uh, maxims. So it was not meant to be that, and it is not. So following these are not going to result in an effective communication. Right, uh, there have been claims that it's, it does not hold cross-culturally, so there have been instances of certain cultures where people uh, don't really value uh, the cooperation as much as they value the, uh, the, the, the non-sharing of information or something like that. So people don't prefer to share the information. Right, but this is highly debatable, the idea that it's not, it doesn't have cross-cultural validity. Uh, and that's one of example which has not been verified. So, so what these are actually? So, uh, <coughs> as I said in the beginning, the, these are the assumptions that hearers and speakers hold about each other in a conversation. So, uh, uh, you assume certain things about speakers, and uh, as a speaker, if you are speaking, I would assume certain things about you. What you are trying to say, where you uh, so. Uh, what exactly is your idea, right? So, and uh, more importantly, these can be and they are uh, flouted quite often in the conversation. Uh, so these, uh, if it's flouted, uh, these are the things that listeners should be able to decode for a successful communication. There is something other than flouting that's called violation of maxims. So if it's violated, they are not supposed to be decoded by the uh, hear us. So when we lie, for example, we violate maxim of quantity. We are not giving as much information as is relevant for the communication, but we don't expect that to be uh, decoded by the 
listeners. So those are not flouting then, those are violations. This is an important distinction which may come uh, handy for you. So uh, another of those. So this is the famous, I mean, I don't know if it's famous for you, but for us, all those who are in PhD, these are the famous PhD comics. And uh, as one of those dreaded emails by your professors, so can you stop by my office? We need to talk. Now that's, if you get those two lines in your email, it's going to, I mean, you are going to get up immediately and go to the office without asking anything else. Now, it could mean a lot of things. So uh, you are fired, as in you are no longer my student. I won't take your dissertation. Uh, I forgot what your project is about. <laughs> Can you please come and explain? And I have a trivial request that I'm too embarrassed to write in an email. It turns out in this comics, it was a trivial request that he was too embarrassed to write in the email. Most of the times, a lot of times, it's something like that. So first two generally doesn't uh, happen. Now, uh, what happens here is uh, we need to talk is violating the maxim of quantity. It's not giving enough information, the amount of information that is needed. And then uh, these are what's called implications, right? So you could have multiple implications. If you don't have enough information, uh, you don't know what to stand out of that. So, and this uh, could depend on your previous experience uh, of the situation and the, your relationship with the person. So it's not fixed for everybody. So uh, some, for somebody else, this will change. Now, so, uh, Clearly, when we flout a maxim, it generates an implicature. Uh, and so the last cartoon was maxim of quantity. Uh, implicatures, uh, they tell us what exactly we want to express without actually saying those. So uh, the professor didn't say anything. Right? Most of the time, we don't really say everything. So most of the time in our conversation, we do flout maxim of quantity. So they are flouted more than they are actually followed, right? Uh, also, uh, implicatures are <laughs> distinguished from a very related idea is called entailment. And uh, the distinction between the two could be understood in terms of truth conditions. So if uh, A entails B, uh, and uh, that would mean that whenever A is true, B has to be true. If that's not the situation, then uh, there is the, the, the two propositions don't have an entailment relationship. So, uh, so for example, example uh, something like Ravan was assassinated. Uh, uh, in this case, if Ravan had not died, uh, this whole proposition would have been false, right? So Ravan was never, if, if the person doesn't die, that person can never be called to be assassinated, right? So this means uh, if we say, if this is true, that Ravan was assassinated, wherever this is true, Ravan died has to be true, right? It can never be a case that this is false and then this becomes true, true. right? And uh, also, it cannot be cancelled. So we'll see what that means. Implicatures, on the other hand, they are uh, cancelable. So uh, that means that uh, it's not necessary that whenever A is true, B has to be true. And we stop there. So we really don't know what more to say about this. So for example, this uh, example, Draupadi had the baby and got married. Uh, it only implicates uh, that the baby was born before the marriage, right? So a normal, a default uh, interpretation would be that the first the baby was born and then she got married, right? But it certainly is cancelable by this, uh, adding this, but not necessarily in that order, right? So if you say something like Draupadi had the baby and got married, but not necessarily in that order, the implicature is cancelled now, right? So uh, this uh, then uh, cannot uh, be called entailment. You cannot do this with in, uh, entailments, right? So uh, Ravan was assassinated and he died, but it not in that order would not really work, right? So he cannot die before being assassinated. 
Okay, so uh, there are it should be three broad categories, not two. Okay, so uh, there are three uh, broad categories of implicatures. Uh, so yeah, it, it could be two depending on how you uh, look at it. So one is uh, uh, conversational implicature. Uh, so for example, somebody asked you how was the coffee and so you say well, uh, somebody introduced you to the Jaggery coffee here and said how was the coffee. So you say well, it was definitely different. Right, but you could uh, be implying that it was, you didn't like it, right? And you don't, because the other person was really excited about it and he really liked the coffee and he said that he highly recommended the coffee. You don't want to offend that person or something. So, so you'd say, oh, well, it was definitely different and probably you're implying that's not good. So what you do here is you flout maximum of quantity and you generate an implication. If the other person is intelligent enough, that he or she will get the idea that what you're trying to say here. Right? Uh, within a uh, conversational implication, for some people, for me, it's a different uh, kind of implication altogether. There's something called a scalar implication. Uh, <coughs> this works with quantifiers only. So, uh, uh, there is this idea of weak quantifier and strong quantifier uh, if, uh, and it's a very formal idea so I won't get into that formal but you could just uh, uh, understand in very general terms that if a weaker quantifier is used it implies that the stronger one does not apply. Right. <laughs> so for example uh, if you have something like there will be four teams for the summer workshop so what you assume uh, that there are four teams, not more, not less. But uh, if you have done a little bit of logic, you would know that this sentence would be, uh, there will be four teams would be true, even if there are more than four teams, right? So strictly logically speaking, if you have five teams, then also this is not false. There is still are four teams, right? But uh, what uh, in language, unlike in logic, uh, all these uh, numbers, the hard numbers, they generate uh, a, an implicature uh, which people understand that uh, it's, uh, it's flout by flouting the maximum of quantity is that when you are saying the smaller number, that means the bigger number does not apply. So if, if the bigger number would have applied, you would have uh, said the bigger number. Right, but in case there are less than four teams, uh, so logically as well as in language, that would be false. Right, so uh, we'll have more of uh, this uh, conventional implication, but uh, just to define it arises from the part of a meaning of a word, but not part of its truth conditions. So the other two, these two conversational implicator and scalar. Both of these involved maxims and flouting of maxims. Conventional implicator does not involve flouting of its, uh, uh, does not involve, uh, sorry, they involve truth conditions. This does not involve truth conditions, right? You don't uh, evaluate the truth conditions in this case. It arises from a particular choice of words or syntax rather than from the conversational maxims. And they may be, uh, they are also uh, cancelable. So sometimes they are claimed to be semantic but not pragmatic. So uh, for this, uh, one of the easiest examples would be the idiomatic expressions, uh, where so if you say, I have butterflies in my stomach or something like that, so you don't literally have the butterfly in your stomach, you are implying something else, right? So it's not the literal meaning that you're taking. And uh, it's not out of the immediate conversation that the implicature uh, arises. So it's by convention associated with that. So those are the kind of things that are conventional implicature. Uh, they claim to be uh, semantic and not pragmatic. But uh, I would again uh, say that uh, we'll see in the next slides that it's actually not really semantic. So it's not that they will always hold. So, so semantic and pragmatic is like my semantics is something which is inviolable. So, which always holds. That's generally called semantics. Pragmatics is something which you don't understand and which, uh, which could change. 
Hey, so these uh, were the two major uh, early theories on which uh, pragmatics is based. Lot of uh, pragmaticians will use one or those, uh, one or both of those theories. Uh, so uh, we tried to merge those two, and this is probably the last of the mm, uh, cartoons. So, uh, and this is very simple. So, uh, Happy New Year! Are you making a prediction or a wish? So the person, no, I'm just trying to be polite here. And so what do we mean uh, when we say we are trying to be polite? So uh, uh, let's come back to that coffee example. So uh, why do we f uh, flout uh, those maxims, the maxims of quantity, uh, assuming that we all are rational beings? And that's the assumption of both speech act theory and uh, the cooperative principles. And that assumption probably does not hold true. But despite that, uh, if we assume that we are rational beings and we want our chatbots to be as rational as we are, uh, why then do we flout the maxims? So if we cooperate, we know that our uh, conversation is going to be good and uh, fine. Then why do we flout this maxim? So why? Well, it was definitely different and not. It was horrible. So you could have been straightforward. Right, so uh, the answer probably lies uh, in this cartoon. So uh, that's probably the reason. So most of the people would, and if, even if you don't use the exact word being polite, you could use it in a different way. So you could phrase that same idea in different ways, right? Now, uh, one of the earliest. Uh, Theories of politeness uh, that was by Brown and Levinson. It was 1978, and then it was again 1987. It was published as a book, and this is probably one of the most uh, famous theories of politeness, also, and something which most of the people would know, and something which is really well articulated and formalized too. It says that certain speech acts or uh, certain linguistic structures. Uh, the later refined versions uh, say linguistic structure initially it was the speech act. So uh, we're assumed to be inherently polite, right? So if you use those, they have to be polite. Or certain by uh, by reasoning, you could say that certain are inherently impolite. Right? So the polite ones include uh, so requests, apologies, compliments. Uh, there's a long list, and they make a distinction between negative and positive politeness, which has nothing to do with the real meaning of negative and positive. So they are completely different ideas. Uh, and uh, they give a long list, basically, of what things are polite. right? They, in fact, give a hierarchy that when you say this, you are being more polite. When you are saying this, you are being less polite. And clearly, things like this really doesn't work in linguistics. So. Uh, the theory is uh, has been attacked from all sorts of places, and one of the major, uh, besides the rational being assumption, so that's 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 largely that no longer holds in pragmatics. If you look at the use of language, you'd you'd also be as sure as most of the pragmatists that we are not rational beings. But besides that, uh, uh, given uh, sufficient context. Any structure could become polite or impolite. That's a very strong uh, claim to make. And so uh, it's that they may not always be polite, but depending on certain contextual factors, which include, again, a <coughs> lot of things, uh, the cultural setting, the interlocutors that are involved, the immediate discourse factors, anything could be polite or impolite. Right? So uh, that's a pretty strong claim. But let's uh, look, have a look at a short survey, which one looks polite. So if you're sleeping, it's time to wake up. So <laughs> you'll have to raise your hand. And uh, so which one looks polite? How many people for the first one? <laughs> how, how many disagree that this, how, for how many people this looks bad, really bad? One, two. Three, four, five, right? So for five people, the first one looks bad. How about the second one? How many people find it good? <laughs> so a couple of people, right? Uh, 
let's say so uh, so for the first one uh, so for those uh, who thinks that it's bad why do you think it's bad so the linguistic structures aren't wrong but uh, it denotes a certain impatience or urgency yeah and Polite and it seems a little sarcastic. Yeah. Yes, uh, that seems to be closer. The fact maybe we could make it less polite and uh, can you please move out of this room? Then, yeah. yeah, that seems much better, right? Does it depend on how it uh, sounds? Yes, so uh, the idea is to get it through the text for now, so speech would be much easier. No, but I can imagine, like I was just reading this uh, uh, you know, fire in, a, in, the, in London, in one of the mm -hmm. tower blocks, there's a media fire right now. And I can imagine the policeman saying this, <laughs> and it would be considered completely fire. Getting people out of... Uh, you know, the first one. Yeah, getting people out of... But will they say kind enough? Maybe. They're British. They're British. Yes, so. <laughs> no, but I'm pretty sure we'd say it a little differently, right? Yeah, so. I mean, kind enough in this context sounds a little, yeah. little too much. It might be, uh, okay, so it might not. So it's, it's, it's a bit like uh, the flouting of Maxim kind of whole thing. Because you, suppose you're saying something to somebody repeatedly and they're not getting out. And then yeah. you would say it. And then this would be actually quite, it's not like impolite. It is not uh, yeah, perfectly so polite. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's assertive. It's much more assertive. Will, it, will you be kind wrong. enough to please move out of the room right away? Because, you know, you might just get killed if you stay here. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of thing. Okay. Yeah, so. No. No, he's not using the kind of swear words that he should be using in a fire situation. <laughs> <laughs> Second one is polite with friends. Yeah, yeah right. So, okay. So the thing is, uh, when uh, Brown and Levinson claimed that uh, the uh, the questions, the indirect ones, would be always polite. And the more indirect, so they have this uh, direct correlation. The more indirect you are, the more polite you are. So, without any other background, certainly that seems not to be working. So, if I make it little less uh, indirect, or maybe uh, so, uh, that becomes probably more acceptable to the speakers. The second thing is uh, there is certain kind of variation among this small group of people, right? How about now? So it's, it's the narration. So somebody is okay, narrating. I, I am totally offended <laughs> by the <word. laughs> So That's <laughs> Right? Uh, so there were a la la large number of people who would say that it was, but it seems to be gone. What about the second one? So uh, I was just lazy not to type out the whole story here. But uh, so uh, it's a li little scary. F how come fire <laughs> came back? <laughs> no, so. Yeah, so yeah, that's the idea. So you work together, you are colleagues, and somebody is wired up and really into Python doing some really serious DNN stuff and doesn't realize that there is a fire and you <laughs> move out, you idiot, what are you doing? So he won't say, ah, don't be so impolite to me, how dare you? <laughs> right, so, uh, and this, uh, if you could imagine for any utterance that I would give you, it's not just, you could use much stronger swear words, I just didn't want to use that, and that's cancelable. 
तो स्वेयर वर्ड्स सो द आइडिया इज डेफिनेटली दिस ब्राउन एंड लेविनसन पोज इट एज एन इंटेलमेंट रिलेशन राइट सो ही सेड दैट इफ यू हैव दिस इट इंटेल्स दैट यू आर पोलाइट If you have this, it entails that you are impolite. So that was not Brown and Levinson. That was Jonathan Cole paper, 1996 paper, where he tries to understand impoliteness in a very similar way as uh, Brown and Levinson did. So uh, how do we uh, explain this? Uh, how do we uh, uh, account for this uh, thing? So is there a way to generalize this? So it turns out that the uh, conventional implicatures the idea of conventional implicatures may prove uh, useful in understanding the phenomenon of politeness especially the normative politeness so without the context you could still judge the politeness value right so you have there is something going on in your head you still have an implicit context right within which and which which is being evoked when you are making those <coughs> judgments that is polite too polite or impolite but when you have a clear uh, context you don't evoke that thing right so uh, one of the things is uh, ki the whole interpretation of politeness it can be contested upon so the way uh, people could talk about and chat about it and say no this was not really that impolite or you could agree and you could also disagree so you could contest upon it and a uh, lot of researchers have posited this as an emergent property of the discourse itself so it's something which is not in your structures right it's not it's not in your words it's not in your sentences it emerges uh, when within a discourse while you are talking to each other uh, politeness is something that just comes about right uh, but despite this uh, a large chunk of politeness interpretations seem to be default interpretations right, right? so they seem uh, what you think uh, them to be polite or impolite they turn out to be actually polite and impolite right without so your interpretation without the context fits well within the context also so you can easily think of context for these where these would be okay kind of things right so that will agree with your judgments now uh these are uh, uh default interpretations uh, that you have uh, without actually having access to the real context uh these may arise out of the language specific structures so those structures are language specific they may not be so in all the languages and those structures uh, seem to be conventionalized for uh politeness implications so politeness effect itself uh, is the implication and so uh, what uh, what uh, what is uh, called as the interactional approaches to politeness uh, basically it uh, is uh, marina turkaurafi's uh, dissertation so 2001 dissertation that put puts forth this idea of uh, combining three uh, different uh, <coughs> ideas from different fields so uh, frames from cognitive linguistics how many of you know about frames no okay so uh, it's very simple idea it says that uh, your uh, this uh, brain uh, so it's, it's it's an idea of how do you actually uh, uh, understand and store your language so the something like word net or you have heard of frame net right so it's the frame so that that's the frame in the frame net so similar ideas they they are put together in your heads right so or it may not be similar but it would be related in some way and so uh, and the more uh, those ideas occur with each other the greater is the chance that when you uh, listen to one thing the other ideas get activated right so that's one uh, part the other is of course the speech acts and the implicature so uh, you put together uh, these three and uh, so here the statement goes something like this so there are certain kind of speech acts that co occur with certain kinds of politeness effects over a long period of time in a large number of discourse right uh, over a period of time uh, both of these become part of the same frame so whenever those structures uh, are there uh, since 
uh, the politeness effect is part of the same frame that one the other one is also retrieved right. This whole process uh, is called the process of conventionalization and that is uh, that is pretty much a cognitive uh, linguistic explanation of uh, implicatures. So, uh, now, uh, you could we could take it one step further and we could say that the greater is the frequency of the co occurrence. Uh, so, you have say 20 times you had this structure coming up, and all uh, out of those 20, for 18 or 19 times you had a similar uh, interpretation that is polite, right. So, greater is this frequency, greater is the probability of a certain kind of politeness effects being produced as conventional implicature for those structures. Right, so this is a completely frequency based explanation. Uh, for me, it is slightly more complex. So, your frame uh, may not contain just the frequency, it may contain lot of other factors also. But uh, Tarkov Rafi's explanation is purely frequency based and uh, it holds uh, not just for politeness, but for a host of other conventional implications as well. So, that is how uh, any of those conventional implications come to be formed. There have been uh, so uh, empirical evidence, so that is part of my PhD thesis. So, it seems that around 80 percent of this impoliteness interpretations they are conventionalized, right. But, uh, yeah, okay. So, it, it was a long uh, study. There are two ways uh, you do this. Uh, one was of course, the user study that you conduct, you ask people to rate uh, say two or three structures on the politeness level and then you see without the context and then you see ki, uh, how many people agreed on that. The other way is to uh, look at the, so I had an annotated corpus right and I uh, simply looked at the how many times a particular kind. So, for example, honorifics are generally considered that they would be polite. So, uh, I looked at honorifics and uh, so I counted the frequency, right. So, how many times it occurs with polite uh, interpretation and how many times it occurs with impolite interpretations, right. So, uh, the figures add up and they add up from, so triangulation if you, so it adds up from three uh, different sources actually from the survey, from the corpus and when I, uh, so in uh, the inter annotator agreement was something around this and so there are a lot of uh, different things which uh, signal that it is around 78 to 80 percent where people agree without the context, right. So, it seems uh, to be uh, conventionalized for those uh, 80 percent of cases and uh, the good thing is that it lends itself to a rather straightforward and effective computational modeling. So, uh, the system that I built that had uh, around 78 uh, percent. Uh, agreement with the human annotator. So, uh, so that 78 percent was the easy part. The difficult part is the rest of the 20, 22 percent which is not conventionalized and which emerges out of uh, the discourse and that is so that means that is not part of the conventionalized implicatures, they are part of the conversational implicatures and how do you model and understand conversational implicatures, right. Okay, so the last, have I have a short, no, it is, yeah, it looks like, <laughs> so, ok. So, I will really do it in uh, very, very quickly. So, the last part is, I will do it very quickly because probably it would be helpful for Mitesh uh, in doing the chat bots if you do not uh, use this uh, earlier. It may, it, it may be useful for anybody who is doing any kind of conversational agent. So, the idea of how uh, the information uh, is structured and packaged in a discourse, right. So, that is called information structure, it is also called information packaging. It turns out that lot of languages uh, in, uh, so mo almost all the languages will have this in their speech. In written discourse, lot of languages carry very distinctive que uh, cues for packaging new and existing information. So, the, they make distinction between these two kind of information. Right, and it seems to be the among all the others, this is probably the most explicitly coded information in a language. So, there have been tons of 
models of uh, information structure and they overlap a lot. What I'll do here is go through the f my four models and I won't go through the models, I'll just give you the uh, basic idea. So uh, the first model is called focus background model which is very simple so when you have a question, uh, sorry, when you have a question answer pair or you are correcting or you're confirming something so your speech uh, will have uh, certain different kind of prosody than the ones where you're just stating so uh, uh, something like how many people were there there were four people now it turns out that the answer to the question is generally focused it has a slightly uh, different prosody from the ones where you're just stating that there are four people Right, so uh, similarly, this is very obvious. Uh, confirming an information, you would know. So, so you'd say ki, there were, you know, there were two hundred people uh, in the conference. So there were how many people in the conferences? So, so be, and you could have a uh, lot of uh, cues there on the part where it's focused, right? Uh, but uh, languages they vary in their marking of focus. And uh, focus simply means that there are alternatives which might be relevant for the interpretation of current <coughs> linguistic expression. So Krifka has lot of uh, done, he has done a lot of work on uh, focus background model on all of this. Okay, so the other one is slightly oldish uh, model, Halliday's 1967. I'm not doing the whole thing, but. Uh, the one uh, uh, important idea is the idea of new and given information. So new is something which is not recoverable from the preceding discourse. So it has not been talked about earlier uh, and the both of these uh, interlocutors, they don't know about the new information. And given is something which is present in the immediate CG. So CG is common ground is something something like the all of those things that both of you know the that's that constitutes cg common ground so uh, now let's uh, look at this uh, one example i know that john stole a cookie what did he do then and it was like he returned the cookie right so uh, this is uh, was something focused uh, that's the answer to he do what did he do and the whole of uh, this uh, cookie is given so you know about the cookie you won't focus the cookie right however there have been recent studies and there have been uh, some psycholinguistic experiments uh, with the, all the reaction time experiments and I there are a lot of eye tracking experiments uh, which show that there is lot of distinction between focus and new information you you could focus old information also it's not necessarily that you focus new information but most of the time new information is something which you try to focus so if you bring in new information so something uh, so i could think of a, so if you have a shift in topic that would be the new information right so if the if i take mitesh's example so if you are uh, talking about a movie and talk about say tom hanks and then you begin to talk so till then the topic would be the movie right so but when you begin talking about tom, tom hanks your topic shifts and the first time it shifts there will be focus on tom hanks right to indicate the change now for english it's difficult to uh, really capture all of this but for uh, languages like Japanese or even for Hindi to a certain extent you have the particles. So for Hindi you have to and to is something uh, which you, so there is a big debate whether to is a topic marker or not but for me it's not really a topic marker but uh, it's something where uh, you, if you shift the topic you attach to to the new topic, right. <coughs> it does, yeah. So. Uh, uh, so th take the Tom Hanks example. So we are talking about say, what's the Forrest Gump? Say, yeah. So uh, Forrest Gump, the very good film thi, Tom Hanks tha. Uh, Tom Hanks, to mujhe bahut pasand hai. He's a star, right? So, <laughs> so you shift the topic with to, right? It's much easier in languages like Japanese where they have dedicated topic markers. So wherever you have a uh, shift in topic, they don't need even a shift in topic. So whatever is the topic, you get the marker. So it's very easy to recognize topics there, but... Uh, aren't, there, aren't there other syntactic or other kind of devices in English? 
yeah okay. you do have so you have fronting so yes uh, so fronting is one of the devices so where uh, uh, you take out the topic and put that in the front right and uh, that you would not normally do so uh, tom hanks i really like so that things like that so then you would know that but it's not very uh, reliable like the to marker or the japanese thing so you could also have other reasons for fronting but that could be one cue there are others which we need to look at the data and find so look at the real actual data what people are doing when they are uh, sh uh, changing the topic right so okay so uh, the third one is topic comment model so topic is something the entity about which the information is being given and so this is the third model so there have been some terminological overlaps and some differences between those terminology across different models so for this uh, comment is the information itself and topic is the entity about which it doesn't talk about the new and old information it only says that you give information about something this this is one of the uh, simplest uh, models of information structure right so but in general it claims that topics are frequently refer to the given information something which has already occurred in the discourse right uh, but uh, it may be new as well so uh, that's very rare uh, generally topics they refer to the given information right uh, topic may also uh, contain focus uh, th that gives rise to contrastive focus contrastive topics so uh, uh so if you are focusing topic so there might be two uh, topics at least two topics to choose from so you could have tom hanks and anybody else so tom cruise maybe so uh you could say ki uh, tom cruise to dekhne mein sirf smart hai waise to is right uh any day i would go for tom hanks right uh the last one is uh, was uh, the topic focus model so uh top uh so this is what lot of people would refer to information structure as its uh, topic and focus but as you see there have been lot of other overlapping information it may get confusing at times so topic is something which is contextually bound in the sense that it is accessible in hearer's memory so this is uh, was called waldubi's model so the idea of uh, this is waldubi's model and it's uh, actually uh, krifka expands on this a lot so uh, so uh, this is uh, the important thing uh, that it's it's accessible in hearer's memory in the sense that it is salient so uh, it's there right in the front of what you're doing and it's activated so you can use that so uh, this is more precise than uh, some of the other uh, the previous new and given thing because it doesn't really define new or what is what do you mean by new so uh, but this uh, says that in your immediate memory uh, whatever is uh, there whatever is activated that's topic you may have heard something about something and you may not, may have forgotten about that right so you uh, uh, that doesn't form part of your topic also uh, this uh, topic is very very different from this one right so here the topic is fixed you know the entity could be anything about which the information is being given this it it could be that entity it could be all other entities which is salient and activated in the memory of the speakers right focus uh, which is not shared uh, by the speaker and the hearer which is not background knowledge and which is not c construable so linguists have this habit of giving you know weird terminology so c construable is anything which does not have semantic content in previous discourse which is in the simplest terms this means that which was not there in the previous discourse right so that's called c uh, construable so uh, which is uh, largely saying that uh, it was not there in the discourse and it was definitely not salient and activated right and of course uh, the idea is that you uh, got to have uh, you have a linguistic cues and devices to mark all of these 
So you have to uh, you have cues to mark topic and you have cues to mark focus. Right. So where do you uh, use uh, pragmatics? People have been using it for uh, conversational agents and chatbots and similar systems. Uh, it might be a little helpful uh, to use some of these ideas to improve upon the system to to uh, you know, to really uh, extract certain kind of information from what your user is typing. Or it's easier if it the user is speaking actually. Uh, of course, uh, it might prove to be useful uh, for analyzing the language for other NLP tasks, right? So uh, the the whole of that. Uh, if you remember the first talk, the, the the slide was with all those tasks which could be done by 2050, something like that, right? So the social stuff, a lot of those social stuff that was really read for long period of time. So those. Uh, uh, could be handled or not not handled, but those could do well if they use uh, if, if they if they find out a way to formalize some of these ideas. Right. So one, that one of the things is these are already uh, pretty abstract ideas, but you need to abstract further to you know contain that within a mathematical model. Right. So uh, uh, that could be one of the ways. And so a couple of things that people have actually done already. So that will be done by. Munajit and so you. Okay, so if you think pragmatics is hard, uh, that's what uh, the idea Ritesh gave you, then you are absolutely right. So pragmatics is really very, very hard. And uh, people have been trying to do uh, things and they have try tried doing almost everything which Ritesh talked about, but uh, it's like at a way, I mean, either the uh, kind of problems we can solve are really very trivial from a linguistic sense. We have made very little progress. So when you talk of computation in pragmatics, uh, there are three fundamental things that people try to do, right? So one is in pragmatics, we talk about these implicatures, including politeness, which Ritesh gave a lot of examples. So all these implicatures, it would be very cool if you were given a conversation. You could look at the conversation at, it, at every stage, annotate the conversation with implicatures, which implicatures later get cancelled and all these things, right? So that would give you a very in-depth knowledge of the conversation and you can use it in various ways, uh, especially in the last part, which is dialogue planning and response generation and things like that. So this is one where people have tried to invest some time. Uh, identifying automatically implicatures, building classifiers for different kinds of implicatures. Um, and of course, I already said the third one is how then you use those implicatures in say dialogue planning, in chatbots and so on. The middle point is pretty interesting. So here the question is this. So if you think of it, right, the way Ritesh presented it and anybody would present pragmatics, is it seems like a bunch of rules without any pattern. So you say politeness comes from this, whereas scale, uh, scalar implicatures come from something else. Whereas, so if you look at some of these, you know, so Grigian maxims, he started with four, went to seven, somebody modified it to, you know, eight or something. And then the number of implicatures, Grais probably wrote a few. It, the list kept, you know, growing, growing, growing. Today there are some 20, 30 different things people talk about. Nobody agrees on what is the set of implicatures. So the question is, can we come up with a very generic computational model of pragmatics, which can, you know, kind of give rise to all kinds, of, all sorts of implicature. So this is also another very interesting thing. So in this talk, I'm just going to give a brief example of this, again from politeness, because Ritesh uh, talked about it a bit. So you already know the theory. And then I will very quickly, I mean, I will spend some time so, talking about this, this is a very new stuff and actually very interesting. I think it holds a lot of promise. I will not get into the third thing because, um, I mean, you have seen it on and off in Alan's talk, in uh, various talks where how you, you know, so you can also imagine that if you had classifiers for implicators, how do you use it for dialogue planning and things like that. So, uh, so there are a lot of work, but I'm not getting into those. Th so let me talk about uh, this work. Uh, it was one of the best paper nomination. It 
won the best paper nomination for ACL 2013. So it's, it's, I think, one of the first work of its kind in the field. Uh, and later, people did on other languages like Ritesh did for Hindi. So this is on English. And it's a very interesting work. So what these guys do, they start with the theory of pragmatic, uh, I mean, theory of politeness and all the kinds of things people have talked about. What is polite, what is not polite, and what are the different, what they call politeness strategies. Then what they did, the second problem was to get a huge data set. So they went to Stack Overflow. There are lots of requests, you know, you know, questions, can you help me with this, that, and then people respond. So they got a lot of these Stack Overflow things annotated by people for politeness. So it was a scale of 1 to 10, or something like that. So they did a few more data sets. I will come to them later. But the primary data set was, I think, Stack Overflow and Wikipedia. So in Wikipedia, people do editing. And then uh, if you have ever edited a Wikipedia article or regularly edit Wikipedia article, you'd know that there is an edit history. And people keep arguing about things, especially on controversial topic. So they kind of annotated those edit uh, you know, uh, notes and comments. So these were the two primary data sets. So after that, they defined a set of features. There were 20 of them. I'm showing only 13. And uh, this is just to give an example. So this mostly comes from the theory of politeness. So one common strategy, so these are called positive strategies, and these are called negative strategies for politeness. Uh, so positive strategies, the first is gratitude. So you could say, I really appreciate that you have done something. So words like appreciate uh, would trigger that. Then you have deference, like nice work so far on your rewrite. Um, greetings. So if you start with a, just a, hey, I just try to do this, that's more polite than just saying, I just try to do this. So whether you have greetings or not. Positive words like, wow, this is great. Oh, this reminds me, uh, last year uh, when I was in Grand Canyon, uh, so we were coming back from the canyon, so there was a uh, bus that we had to take and the bus driver asked me um, oh how was it and I said very beautiful and she made a face and said only very beautiful wasn't it awesome so she was I mean probably she thought it was not really polite uh, or I really did not like it and said oh, okay very beautiful kind of thing so um, so these kind of words uh, the negative lexicon is uh, I mean um, <coughs> just the opposite of it, right? So you have these words. Then whether, uh, these are negative strategies. So sorry to bother you. You can start uh, with that, then apologizing, then could you please say more? So when you are going to ask, you are going to apply a negative strategy. So negative strategies, you are making yourself small. I beg to state that typical way of writing applications, right? So those kind of things. Uh, and positive is when you are heightening the ego of the other person. So they had this bunch of these features and on these two data sets, this is Stack Overflow and this is Wikipedia. Yep. Yep. So what are these posts? Uh, oh, so the scores is, um, so it says uh, that if there is a gratitude in the sentence, uh, I mean if this particular feature is one, then 0.87 uh, times out of one, it is polite. Across all the things? Across all the data set, the, the entire data set that they annotated. And the fifth one, uh, if you're going to accuse me, that's not polite. Yeah, that's why it's negative. So if you see, if, if, the neg uh, if there are words from the negative lexicon in the sentence, then it's usually not polite. So if, if there is a direct question, what is your native language or so can you retrieve it or not? So those are negative. Direct start, direct questions are negative. Uh, please do not remove. So please starts are negative. This is interesting. Whereas please in the middle is positive. So this is what they found in the data set. So top quartile I'm not too sure, but uh, I think uh, it's like uh, they took all the polite uh, you know, sentences and then how many uh, in the top quartile has a gratitude. So, so it's a scale of 1 to 10, right? So let's say top quartile will be 7.5 and above. So whatever has been marked there, how many? 78% of those have gratitude. 
So like that. So using these features, they made a classifier. And uh, first, they did human annotation. And inter-annotator agreement was 86% and 80% on wiki and SE. So this is similar to Ritesh's number. You said something like 80, right? And uh, it's not very high. So those 20% might be context dependent, as Ritesh said. So it's hard to judge the remaining 20%. Now, with all these linguistic features, uh, they got 83% in this set and 878. So pretty close to human agreement. So these are pretty good classifiers in that sense. If you had used a random classifier, of course, the baseline would be 50%. And if you used bag of word model, it gives you 79 and 74%. So you get a pretty good 5% kind of improve, 4% kind of improvement with those linguistic features instead of just bag of word features. So this was the classifier. And if you go and read it, you will find more in information. But what made this paper very, very interesting is now they applied these classifiers on a variety of things and tried to come up with a social theory of politeness, when we want to be polite and when we don't uh, want to be polite. So the first thing they studied is in politics. So um, here are two parties, the blue party and the red party, and people uh, Posting, I, I don't remember exactly from where they took the data for this. Um, pro and they analyzed the data of those people. And the blue one, blue is the one which eventually won. So it's not Democratic or Republican or something. Blue is the one which eventually won the elections. So before election, these blue guys were very polite and these red guys were impolite. I mean, not that polite. Um, and what happened after election, so probably they were impolite and they lost the election. So that's why politeness is very important. And after the election, what happened is these guys became more polite. Now they are failed uh, people, uh, failed candidates, whereas this guy became more arrogant and they became less polite. And kind of both merged in the middle. So this was one study. So they call it politeness and social status. Yeah, so maybe that. The second one, this study was on Stack Overflow. It's about reputation of a news of a user. So on Stack Overflow, different users have different reputations. Some are very good at answering questions, know a lot of things and stuff like that. So they are people with high reputation. And then on the other extreme, people with low, low reputation. So as you see, there's an inverse correlation. So very highly reputed people don't need to be that much polite. Whereas low reputation people are typically much more polite on Stack Overflow. And this is highly significant also statistically. Yeah. Mm, the la a third one they looked at is when you ask for something, uh, so when you are at the receiving end versus giving end, so you are asking means you are at the receiving end, and these people are giving the answer, so they are at the giving end. So the receiving end people are much more polite than giving end people, so, so which is also kind of obvious. And the last one is within Stack Overflow, if you look at the different programming language community, so it's also a cultural thing. All, all <coughs> groups are not equally polite. So the uh, paper says if, uh, I mean, the best people to work with or the best language to work with is Ruby. Because you really are surrounded by all polite people who will answer your questions and all. And the worst is Python. Yeah, so I, but I guess most of you work here on Python. So uh, there was a similar study. I don't know if it was quantitative, but there was this, um, you know, I, not study, a blog article on the culture of being impolite in, uh, you know, corporations, big, corpor uh, big IT companies, especially, you know, Apple is very well known for being a very impolite workplace. And the thing was, uh, the title said, uh, well, Mr. Steve Jobs, it's not cool to be rude. So it was very nice, like why the culture should change and how the culture badly affects people. But yeah, it's a very much a part of the culture. So it's pretty much OK to shout in, let's say, Apple or Microsoft or Google, maybe, but not in all companies. <laughs> So yeah, something uh, similar analysis on the emails would be very interesting if you get access to the email logs of these companies. Okay, 
So uh, only this much on politeness. I will move to something else uh, on the you know general computational model. So Ritesh talked about the speech act model. So this model is called the rational speech act model. And uh, as we shall see, so we will slowly build the model and we will see at the end that this model can explain actually a lot of different things. So this model, uh, the people who initially worked on it, Noah Goodman, he's in Stanford and Frank, so they have uh, worked uh, quite a bit on it starting from 2010, 2009. And then Chris Potts also joined the team. In fact, Chris Potts, who is also in Stanford, his PhD is also uh, on pragmatics. So he has also been working. So it's a very active group. Uh, it's called the Language and Cognition Group in Stanford. They have done a lot of very interesting work and studies on this. So we will start with one puzzle. You will have to solve one puzzle to understand how the rational speech act model works. So, so just distribute this. Meanwhile, I will explain you uh, what the puzzle is about. So this is one experiment which Goodman and his team did. It's called spatial reasoning experiment. So you are given a map of a city. So the city has only two areas, one red area and one blue area. In the puzzle, it's a dark gray area and a light gray area. And there's a plaza, which is this dotted circle. And imagine that there is a special kind of flower, which is called gold lily. And the gold lily grew somewhere in the city. You don't know where, but your friend knows. So your friend knows exactly where the gold lily has grown. And the friend tells you the location. But the restriction is your friend can only use a certain kind of phrase. Uh, so the friend can say it's in some area. So the friend can say it's in the plaza, in the gray area, in the um, city, in the blue area, so on and so forth. Or the friend can say it's near, near the plaza, near the city, uh, near the gray area and so on. But no other thing. So the friend cannot say it's you know 5 degrees east and north, uh, 20 degrees north of this particular location or any x, y coordinate. Nothing. So only near and in, these two things. So he, they did this experiment. So friends uh, said something. So essentially there was no friend. So you just say, okay, the gold lily is here. And ask people to guess and mark the position of where the gold lily is. Okay. So now what you have been given are nine cases of, so you are given something like this. So there are these nine cases, A to I. These are the people's guesses. The pluses are where people guessed the location of the gold lily. And here is what they heard. And there are two kinds of listeners. Part of the puzzle is to figure out how these listeners are different. One is lit literal listener and one is pragmatic listener. They will behave slightly differently. And if you get this, you get everything about rational speech act model, actually. This is the crux of it. Uh, and you have to match which one is to which. The only uh, catch is I have moved the plaza positions from here. So you also have to guess the plaza positions. I guess you can solve it in groups. So that will, you know, make it faster. We'll have probably 10 minutes for doing this. You don't have to read. I have explained the whole setup. So you don't need to read what's written there. I have already told you. Maybe solving it in groups of two or three would be faster.
it's plaza is moving so the plaza is moving in these different diagrams a b c d e g h i the plaza is in different positions so assignment 2 is to guess the plaza okay. but just try to solve assignment 1 to actually if you solve 1 2 will be all automatically solved No, 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 you, you should not be able to see the outline of the plaza. No? Okay, I no. So they, the pe people didn't know where the plaza was located? People knew, people knew. but people I removed know. those. Yes, but you see how I can... Oh, that way, yeah, 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 that's the clue. This one is Yes. Listener knows. Listener knows, right? Yes. You guys are done I'm getting it. Yeah, 
Sir Renzo Dano? You want to submit your solution? You had done this, right, Sunana? Sunana, you had done this. <laughs> Anybody done? Okay. So one done. Let's see. <laughs> That's okay. Okay, so we got two. So we got two submissions, and those are correct. Uh, others, you want to try a little more? Okay, go ahead. Try. How much time you guys are going to take? Uh, just two, two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. I'm Samir Wak. I'm a third year uh, PhD student at Princeton. I work broadly in applied crypto. Uh, I work with Pratik Mittal. Um, okay, I have to tell something embarrassing. I'm working with Nishant. Nishant is hosting me. Um, okay, so I came up with this today morning. Uh, so I have known this for a while that I I, uh, I talk when I'm asleep. But then what I found recently was that I swear a lot when I'm asleep. <laughs> so, so initially I thought that I'm a nice, calm so guy. Most of you were, yeah. I mean, whoever have submitted have got it right. So while people are solving it, I can tell you a little bit more. So this problem was uh, from this Panini Linguistics Olympiad, uh, which uh, we organized just before the camp started, uh, I mean, sorry, <laughs> just before this workshop started, there was a two weeks camp, and there we selected the uh, you know, Indian team which will represent India in the International Linguistics Olympiad in Dublin. 
So these are the typically the kind of problems that you see in linguistics Olympiad. You can solve it just by applying logic. Uh, some of them are little more linguistics in the sense of there will be syntax and morphology kind of problems. Still you can solve using only logic. So some of you wanted to know more about the linguistics Olympiad and how you can help. So we are thinking of doing a session on it. Uh, not, not like session for everybody, not like a talk or anything, but just an informal session. So if you are interested, just let me know. One of the afternoons we'll meet for an hour or so. Okay, anybody else submitting? We don't have much time. Okay, we'll move on. Okay, I guess most of you have got it. Uh, the thing, there is only one thing that you have to figure out, right? That what is the difference between a literal and a pragmatic listener. And if you get this, rest of it is pretty easy. Uh, so this is an interesting comparison point uh, where you say the gold lily is in the center of the city by the, lit sorry, is in the city by the literal listener and in the city by the pragmatic listener. So it's exactly the same statement, but two different. And you see this is one which is all over the city. So it should be one of the in, in the cities, uh, which can be the other one. And the only other one seems like this, right? So these two seems to be the potential candidate. And the difference between these two, I mean, if you want to say, say which one is literal. So this is like literally all over the city, right? So it's the lit literal listener. And then therefore, this is the pragmatic listener. So then essentially what the pragmatic listener is doing is trying to, you know, reason about what the speaker would have said if it was here. So if it was here, the speaker would have said it's in the gray area, dark gray area. If it was here, the speaker would have said it's in the light gray area because speaker is trying to give you the maximal information. And uh, therefore, you don't think that these are the places where the lily might grow. It will grow in any other place in the city. Now, there's a vacuum here and that's probably because the plaza was here. So you, most of you got it. Like after you get this, you can systematically work out the rest of it. How do you tell the pragmatic listener that it's literally all over the city? Hmm? <laughs> How do you tell the pragmatic listener that it's like literally all over the city? No, there is only one gold lily growing. How can it be literally all over the city? There's only one gold lily and the listener is saying, uh, telling you where, where it is, right? So for different areas, the user will use different phrase. I mean, the speaker will use different phrase. And accordingly, the listener will decode the phrase and guess the position. So yeah, th those are the answers you got it. Well, and in the case, yep. uh, so the gold lily is near the light gray area. So why right. is it vertical labor and not? Uh, because the plaza, plaza should have been here. E. Plaza, plaza should have been here. So since the plaza was here, if it was inside the plaza, there's the most, uh, you know, specific description you can give and you would give that description. Previously you said near also means in, right? Or is there a... No, no, no. I said you can say only in and near, yeah. no other thing. But I didn't say near like, means no, in. In the previous definition, I mean, or at least in the description, you said there are some red balls. That doesn't mean the others aren't red, right? That's a literal listener. So. I mean, why is it uh, when you say the thing is near the light gray thing? Why is this, uh, why aren't some of them inside the light gray thing? Sorry, I, I'm not getting it. I mean, I'm just, I'm just saying, hmm. in the literal listener, why didn't any of the literal listeners mark uh, when it said the gold lily is near the light gray area? Hmm. Why didn't any of the literal listeners mark it inside the light, uh, light gray area? So we will see the model of the literal listener. So that depends on what the model of the literal listener is, right? So literal listener also assumes what, I, what is true where. So if it is inside, maybe it's not true. But you can define a literal listener slightly differently. How you define the truth value of near? Yeah, it totally depends on that. So I defined it as near means outside, not in. But you could define it otherwise. The only reason I said is, is that uh, some uh, implication? Near is not inside and so the literal listener also does that? Uh, not necessarily. I will show you people did put things inside for near also. I didn't put it in my example, but in real experiment, I will show you in a moment. People did put it, things inside also. So you are right. I mean, near can be interpreted in different ways. Uh, okay. So these are the plazas. 
So, so essentially what is happening is literal listener is choosing an interpretation which is consistent with the literal meaning of the text, whereas the pragmatic listener assumes that the speaker is trying to give maximal information but specifying as a, in, in minim, minimum number of words. So if this was the case that if x some utterance is consistent with situation 1 and situation 2, but there is a simpler way of saying s1 say y but not s2 then x must mean s2 because if it was s1 then speaker would have said y. So this is tip, just the only thing that the pragmatic listener does and by, uh, by doing this and this gives the big difference in the results. So this is what is the rational model, I mean the rationality part of it. So it's the uh, Gryzian maxim that he is talking about that there is a cooperation principle that both the speaker and listener is trying to help each other and number one, number two both are rational, you have to assume both are rational because if the speaker was irrational the model does not work and of course if listener was literal then you see how it works right. So both have to be rational and there is more to it and we will come to uh, the extra parts like what is more to it. Now the question is how do you model this mathematically, we just solved it right uh, with intuitively looking at the patterns, so how do you model it mathematically. So, uh, it is actually a pretty simple model, it just applies uh, Bayes rule repeatedly. So what happens is let us say I have a literal listener model which I call L0 is the literal listener. So it is called let us say the literal, literal listener assigns a probability S given an utterance U. So S is a sp s point in the space, let us call location of interest in this specific example of gold lilies after listening an utterance and if you can compute that, that gives you the heat map that I was showing this pluses right, where the pluses can be for the literal listener. So now the literal listener does simply this, it has a prior probability over all possible positions, some prior probability, uh, we have to define what that prior is, uh, uh, different situation the prior might be different and then it just applies this you know what is called the uh, you know. Um, kind of an activation function. So what this function value evaluates to is if the utterance u is consistent with location s then it is 1 otherwise 0. So when I say in the city all locations on the city are consistent with the utterance, so the probability mass will uniformly divide over all the city right. If I said inside the dark grey box all points inside the dark grey box satisfy this condition and nothing else, so the entire probability mass will spread out over the dark grey box uh, and nowhere else. So this is what the literal listener is. Now what does, uh, how do you define the pragmatic listener? So you do it recursively, so you say now is assume that there is a speaker S1 who is targeting the literal listener. So what the speaker does for the time being ignore this part, the summation part, so the speaker chooses an utterance based on the location, so speaker knows where the lily is exactly, uh, S is and based on that has to choose an utterance, which utterance does the speaker choose, the utterance that has maximum value for this quantity which is, uh, so there is a prior, prior of overall utterances, again we will come to that what this prior could be, for the time being let us assume this is uniform, so similarly this is also we can assume this is uniform over all locations and these quantities how would have the literal listener interpreted if I had said u. So if I had said u what is the location that the lit literal listener would think it was, so I am just plugging in this model here and if that was the case then I want to maximize this probability value for the location that I want the literal listener to guess, so is it clear? And why this summation is, is because it is a like continuous space, so you just want to you know you want the guess to be as close to the real location of the lily, you cannot enforce that it will be exactly the lily right location, it is a space, so that is why you, you could integrate or you could sum and all those kinds of things you could do. So now the pragmatic listener is simple, you just take this same equation instead of this value which is just literally evaluates to every location where this is true, you just plug in this model. So pragmatic listener assumes that the speaker was rational and trying to help me 
So, you basically try uh, instead of this value you plug in this. Now, is it all? What you can do now is define L2, S2. So, it is like I try to reason how you would think of my mental model, of your mental model and you can go into an infinite regression. And mathematicians have shown very interesting results game theoretically what happens when does the infinite regression stop and all. So, there are these interesting puzzles where it never solves, uh, you know stops and you end up in paradoxes and things like that. But for most practical cases and even these guys show L1 is good enough. The solution that you get after L1 is actually approximates real human users much better than L2, L3 and so on. So, uh, you just stop here and you get what is called, this is a rational agent basically, the pragmatic listener. So, we can just uh, work, uh, work out the math a little bit uh, in the next slide. But let me ask you this, what do you think PU and PS practically means? So, probability of uh, you know the situation and probability of the utterances. So, most of the time I mean in this example probably you guessed it was uniform because I said the lily can grow anywhere in the city. But otherwise what would P s represent? Yeah, what the listener knows or believes? Yeah, what the listener knows and believes correct, but usually the shared knowledge of the listener and the speaker. Because you might know a lot, but you would not assume it part of P s if you do not know that the other person knows it. So, this is the shared knowledge. What is the shared belief that although the shared belief is incomplete. So, I might think you know this, but you may not know this. So, and that is all those are the kinds of situations where we land up in misunderstanding and all those kinds of things right. So, similarly what does PU mean? Probability distribution over utterances. How much time I choose to use the specific utterance? No. Uh, so, P u is independent of any s right, P u is just on the space of utterances. So, rather how much precise the speaker wants to say that? Speaker wants to be as precise as possible. As precise as possible uh, which is needed for recovering s. Right? P u is kind of a language model. So, P u tells you uh, so, the uh, you know you could say it is like as I said 30 degree north, uh, 20 degree south of this and that right, but we seldom say this and I will have better examples of why P u is so important, but essentially it means how people usually speak and typically P u is high if the utterance is short and P u is low if the utterance is long. So, this is called uh, you know parsimony of uh, uh, articulation or ease of articulation. So, you want to say as little as possible you do not want to keep giving I mean uh, entire long description which does not really help. So, in a sense your intuition is right. So, it is a very generic probability on the all possible set of utterances and you want to be as small as precise in general if other things given equal. So, in this case right if I had said gold lily is in the city the literal listener will spread out the probability everywhere. So, that is obvious. But what if it was a pragmatic listener? So, the pragmatic listener will choose each point S and evaluate right what is the probability of this being the point if it was the utterance if U was this. So, let us see one by one if it was one the pragmatic listener will evaluate that ok in that case the speakers most likely utterance would have been in the light gray area. If it was two it is in the plaza, it was three it was near the plaza and if this was here it is probably in the city that is the most likely utterance. So, the user is more likely to say ok it, it was probably somewhere here or somewhere here. So, in this way basically you evaluate the probability over the whole space and it just works out very fantastically. So, this is how fantastically it works out. So, they did a lot of experiments with real human beings, human users and they also modeled I mean implemented these models of pragmatic listener and the literal listener. So, here are some maps and the heat map show you where the real users thought it was and what this model spreading. So, if it was in the city real users mostly said uh, sorry in red. So, this box right this is the red box. 
So if it's said in red, real users put it all here. Um, of course, literal listener would put it everywhere in the red. Uh, the pragmatic listener also says mostly here only. So it's around the, not in the plaza, it avoids the plaza, but everything else in the red. How do you know the pragmatic listener? They have the model, right? The equations. They model the equations. So this is a real user experiment. The user was told exactly the way I said, right? That your friend is telling you the location, which is in red. Your friend is trying to help you. And now guess. And people marked, what do you think where it is? And they did it with like 10,000 people. And then they created the heat map from that. OK. There are human beings who are literal listeners, or almost everyone is? There could be human beings who are literal listeners, like very young kids. Very young children might be literal. So uh, one tip, example like this I saw in YouTube video, right? So uh, a kid was learning to do karate or something, and the instructor asked, "Put your, uh, keep your eyes on it." And the kid comes in. <laughs> yeah. So they are literal listener in that sense, right? And it could be under some mental conditions that people can be literal listeners or very low IQ. Lots of cases. But in this experiment, they were all pragmatic listeners. So similarly, all these, right? So. The near thing that uh, you were asking, Sanket, so if you see here, so this is the literal listener, and there is some you know, probability that it's inside. Yeah, if it's near blue, it's a lot, lot inside. Although it's like mostly on the edges, yeah. but it's both inside and outside. So how you interpret near, it, it depends on that. But if you see the literal one, it's all outside. Here also, it's all outside. Yeah, so, so in this it is interesting because these guys put, I mean, both the people and the models put it like really on the white blocks, but here the little listener puts it all over. So this is all good. So it's interesting how people are making uh, more assumptions than the pragmatic listener it's in the fourth and the fifth. They're having some more priors that's biasing them towards that top left region in, in the blue region or uh, smudging that distribution in between. Yeah, so I both agree and disagree. So let me say that why I disagree first. Uh, I mean, not disagree, uh, in the sense that there's a caveat. It's only, let's say, 1,000 people. So if you did a very large number, things might have evened out. So with that catch, you are right, especially when it comes to these kind of cases. So when you say in the red, people usually give it in the just the middle of red. That's the prior bias that people have. Whereas the system spreads it out a little bit more. So that bias they mention in the paper. Uh, but the other things are harder to say whether it's a bias or because of lack of data that you see this kind of thing. But I agree, I can imagine that for near plaza, people have the idea that if, if you didn't have the constraint based system, you would have said something like between the plaza and the You are not allowed to say between. But I think they can't switch off the idea that this could have happened. That's true. So they might be biased. That's, that's possible. OK, so now this was the model of the literal listener. Uh, sorry, pragmatic listener. What about pragmatic speaker? So then you also have to model a pragmatic speaker. So they did it. It's Chris Potts' work. And he gave, a, uh, gave the invited talk in EMNLP on this work. So with a different game. The game is you are shown a set of pictures, usually of human faces. Uh, but they did it with tools, human faces, and few more categories. And one of them is a target. Let's say here R1 is the target. And you have to articulate, I mean, give a small short phrase to your friend so that your friend is able to dis disambiguate between which one is the target. I mean, choose the target from the thing. So if this was the case, right, these three figures are shown to you and your friend in random order. So you cannot say the first one because they are randomized. The order is randomized. And this was the target. What would you have said? Beard. So beard is the obvious thing here, right? Um, if it was this person, no beard, no glasses. So like that, people say. You could have also said beard and glasses for the first person. You could have said man with the beard and glasses. But you would only say beard. Actually, people don't say only beard. People say man with beard. Uh, apparently, that man with part comes so naturally that they cannot switch off, as Silvana was saying. Machine says only beard, but I mean, they are machine model. 
So anyway, but people hardly say man with glasses and specs. They will always say man with beard and stop there. So they did collect a lot of data and the mathematical modeling of this is almost identical. I mean just symmetric. So uh, you have the target T. Sorry for you know using different set of symbols. Instead of T, I could have used here S, which was the previous case, right? They use different symbols in different you know papers. So and I just you know it took screenshots of the equations. So I had to stick to what they use. Uh, M is the message. So same as U utterance. Uh, L M T is the same function as I showed delta in the previous thing. So it says it's one if message is consistent with the target L0. So it's the same function. And this is actually, they call it cost of message in this, but in the previous one we used it as PU. So it's the same, PU is same as CN essentially. So they first model a literal speaker. This looks complicated, but it's exactly the same formula written differently with some more assumptions. So it says that the speaker, the literal speaker will say M given uh, this target T and this you know, evaluation function. So this is very important by the way, like otherwise you'll end up in cases which Sanket was pointing out. What is the interpretation of near and kind of things. So this is given to you. What is the interpretation of these messages? And uh, then uh, this essentially shows it's just two probability values, right? So this is log of LMT is essentially the delta function because if you think of it e power log of 0 is essentially 0 and e power log of 1 is essentially 1. So and, and CM is as I said is the pro probability of the utterance. So it's exactly the same thing they're modeling just uh, scaling it with some lambda. So you could calculate what happens. So if the target was R1 for this speaker, if you, you know, uh, take these three, uh, what you call them, mm, features. So you could say beard, you could say glasses, you could say tie. So both beard and tie evaluates to one uh, for R1. No, sorry, beard and glasses evaluates to one and you normalize. So 0 0.5, 0 0.50. R2, mm, it's glasses and tie. R3 is only tie, so it gets one. So this is the matrix of the literal speaker and the literal speaker will sample from this. So if it was R3, the literal speaker would always say man with tie. Didn't you mention that the speaker is only allowed to say one word? Speaker is, so in their model, yes, the machine says only one word, but the speakers were not allowed, I mean, can say anything. But they were given these features. So they were told, because they might say the person with the squint eyes, that's not uh, valid. Right? So I mean in their experiment they said okay you can use only these features but any combination of features you can use. So sometimes you will need actually multiple combinations to multiple features to disambiguate. Uh, whereas in this case the machine might just say beard or glass or both uh, depends. Okay, so then you go to the pragmatic listener, same thing. So the pragmatic listener basically have the literal speakers model plugged in here and the general distribution of the prior. And then you go to, uh, okay, so if you calculate that, so essentially the pragmatic listener upon, uh, upon hearing Baird will evaluate R1, R2, R3 using this equation and it would come to only this guy has Baird, so this is one, everything else is zero. Glasses, it could be 0 0.5, 0 0.5 and tie, it gives 0 0.33 here and 0.67 to this person. The reason is essentially what you are doing is this was row normalized and you are now column normalizing these values. So if you work out this equation, this will be just column normalization of these values. And then the pragmatic speaker would be again the same equation just instead of this log function, I mean this L function here, you put the pragmatic listener here. So you are now assuming that the listener's mod uh, model is that of the pragmatic uh, listener. And now if you evaluate this, this is another round of row normalization. I mean, now you normalize again this way. So you normalized uh, first this way. I mean, first for the mm, R1, R2, R3, then for Baird glasses type. Now again, you normalize for R1, R2, R3 taking this matrix. So it's a very easy computation. You take the matrix, no, row normalize, column normalize, row normalize, column normalize. And you can keep doing it infinitely. We'll get S1, S2, S3, S4, L1, L2, L3, L4 models, right? But again, here also stopping at S1 is good enough. You don't need to do anything beyond that. 
and on this data then you do a soft max and choose which one you want to say. So this is the whole uh, model that they have. It's clear. Now what do you think lambda is doing here? What happens if lambda is high versus let's say lambda is 1? You said something? Measures the rationality, right? So you can scale the rationality. Like if, if, if it is more, so it's. Uh, it's extremely rational. Extremely rational. There is very little fuzziness. So these values will very quickly go to 1 and 0. So if lambda is very high, within two iterations, the values will become 0 and 1, close to 0 and 1. If lambda was very low, less than 1, then the convergence will be very slow. So that's what lambda controls. It turns out very high lambda is a good thing. So you have a very high lambda, but do it only one step, rather than very low lambda and do it for a long time. Uh, they show in, in some experiments. So yeah, so they did similar experiments with this setup and got very interesting results. Like they completely agree with, uh, partially agree with human judgment, not completely because I said people also say other phrases like, you know, the man with the, so some extra things people say. So then they trained a neural network on what people say and coupled it with this model and came up with a model which generates almost exactly like things which people say. So that was the primary work in this paper. Yes. So what's the difference between L0, uh, S1, L1 and uh, S2 there versus the S1 over here? Yeah. Like, so they are no different, they are same. Yeah. So they are same. So just that it, uh, I mean, that's, I also wonder why they did it in different papers. Yeah. Maybe, okay. Uh, so, so there were different papers in which they did all these different things. But essentially the equations are the same. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so what did they do with these models? And they did a lot of interesting things actually. They tried to explain a lot of different implications. So for instance, uh, colors, how do you explain colors is very interesting, right? So if uh, I see that bag and I have, I'm asked to describe the color or if I'm just referring to that black bag, I will say the bag with blue. And I say this because I don't see any other bag with blue. If there were many bags with blue here, so if I have to describe, uh, you know, the guy with blue shirts, a shirt, then probably there are two, three candidates here. And then I have to do quantify it more, right? So I can say blue stripes or, you know, I mean, if we stick to color, I can say navy blue or light blue and this kind of things. So they try in context, you are given two colors and you have to come up with a, one of them is a target and you have to come up with a description. So they use again the same model, but with uh, some learning on top of it. Spatial, I already talked about. This is the work we, you all solved, the gold lilies. Um, so this is interesting. I, I will talk about this very quickly. So what they do is, mm, so this is one very, um, you know, uh, so Ritesh can add more to it. Um, one puzzling thing in pragmatics that sometimes these pragmatic implicatures carry over negation. So the example they cite is this. Um, so if you met your friend after a long time, A and B are friends, they are meeting after a long time and waiting for C. And A asked B, uh, does C smoke and B responded saying uh, C does not, didn't stop smoking. Now what would you interpret? So from denotational semantics point of view, both are possible, right? C never smoked and therefore did not stop smoking and still doesn't smoke. Or he used to smoke and doesn't smoke anymore. Uh, no, sorry, still smokes. So you have one interpretation which C smokes, one interpretation which C doesn't smoke. Now which one is the case? So uh, these kind of implicatures, uh, so it's another uh, kind of this is uh, this, uh, it's not pro projection over negation, but these implications are called things which are presupposed. So if I say, um, uh, so I know that something, that means I believe that, right? So if I say, uh, 
didn't you know that this happened? So I'm expecting my belief model had this that you knew it, right? So, so that's another kind of uh, you know, implicature and people used to tr try to explain these kind of implicatures using semantic properties of the verbs. So know, aware, these kind of verbs presuppose what is being stated is true. And similarly, uh, finish, complete, did not finish, did not stop, had another kind of semantic value. So then it blows up your space. Now these models can explain all those implicatures without the need for any semantic you know, reasoning there. So this paper is a little more complex because interpretation depends on what the question was. So if you ask, did he stop smoking? And the answer is he didn't stop smoking. Uh, the interpretation is different from if you ask, did he smoke? Does he smoke? And you say he didn't stop smoking. It might be <coughs> different in different contexts. So, so they kind of uh, work that out here. Numbers is another interesting thing. So numbers are, you take out some balls, let's say apples in a basket and say some are red. And then they ask people to say, okay, there were five apples in the basket and you say some are red. So how many apples should be red? Uh, do you expect zero? So, so let's say the setup is like this. There are five apples in the box. I take one by one, three apples. I don't know what is inside. And I look at them and they say some apples are red. And now I ask you, to mark whether zero apple was red, one apple was red, some kind of a betting. You have to, I mean, if you have done Silvana's experiments, you'd know what I mean. So you have to allot 100 points over zero apple was red, one apple was red, two apple was red, up to five apples were red. So what do you think people would do in this case? If I say some apples were red, after looking at three. So certainly zero is not correct, right? So you don't give anything on zero. One is possible, two is possible, three, possible four, five, why? Some apples are red from three. No, in this case, all the five could be red. I looked at three apples and I said some apples are red. If all three were red, I would have said some apples are red because I don't know what those two are, right? As opposed to what you answered is the next question. Next experimental setup where I am looking at all the five apples and saying some apples are red. In this case, most likely five apples are not red. So it could be one, two, three, four, but not five. So that depends on the shared belief, right? What you know, I know. And uh, they did this kind of experiments using again the same model and came up with the same kind of heat maps, which I mean, in this case, histograms, uh, which agreed very nicely with what people have to say. Okay. So I will stop here and switch gears a little bit. I mean, this is the last slide I have. So we have been talking about the Rational Speech Act model. Now, okay, uh, I should mention that there are lots of problems with the Rational Speech Act model. The biggest problem is it's not scalable. I mean, you have to, somebody has to give it all the features which the user can say. But in reality, that's not the case, right? User can say anything. Now, under such a situation, how do you model? It becomes a hard problem. So conceptually, it's fine. But as a you know, computational modeling problem, if you want to incorporate this in a chatbot, it's not a solved problem. So, you have, so that's, I think, a very interesting research problem that how you take these ideas and incorporate it into a chatbot as a generic pragmatic reasoning kind of thing. There are other kinds of implicatures also. So these are all, I mean, the Rational Speech Act model only explains or mostly explains scal scalar implicatures. But there are these conventional implications like keep your eye on the target or you said something butterflies in the tummy kind of thing. So those are different. Rational speech check model cannot explain those, right? And uh, we are doing a survey to find out a little bit more on the something which is in the boundary of conventional implicature, which is, so we use these constr uh, constructs like words like but and if so these are called discourse connectives because they connect uh, one, uh, two clauses or two sentences or two arguments more generally. So let's say these are, let's say, four possible tweets. One of them is really true, actually really real. We took it from Twitter. So it says, I also love Vilayat Khan Sahab, but lagta hai ki Nikhil Banerjee zyada spontaneous the. So both are sitar players. Where? And I also, 
so same thing just the but is missing i love vilayat khan sahab lagta hai ki nikhil banerji zyada spontaneous the which one do you think is more natural first one first one look at this i also love vilayat khan sahab but he is too good i also love vilayat khan sahab he is too good which one second one so what is but doing here If it is already a ongoing discussion about two people, then the first, yeah. the third one might make sense. No, no. Uh, between these two, you are saying this might make yeah. sense. Yeah. So, yeah. If it is an ongoing discussion about something else, but if it's a tweet, let's say it's a tweet, then which one do you think second. in this context? Second. Right, second one. And what is the reason? Yeah, the meaning is the same. Both the referent is the same <coughs> when uh, you put a but there the, the referent is changing actually what does but mean what does but logically do it's just and right yeah. a but b means both are true so why is a problem i'm saying both are true so but is overloaded and what is that meaning uh, i have two opinions which might be which might seem conflicting contrast so but always expects a contrast between the two arguments right so that's the conventional implication of but even though the logical implication of but is just and you know both the facts are true but the conventional implication is it's a contrast so uh, how many of you have done this experiment this one that silvana's experiment okay those who have not uh, you know silvana might contact you please 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 do it i mean we'll get some data it hardly takes what 10 minutes 15 15 15 minutes so you will see lots of similar kinds of tweets and you have to say you know you have to bet 100 points on which one do you think is real i mean i am showing here 2 2 you will see four or six of those and but uh, i mean but yes but but i have a, yeah, but I have a complaint about that survey it finally didn't tell me like what was really yeah it does tell you the score and you want to see the result Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I wanted to know which is more. It it did tell you the score, right? Yeah. Yeah, it yeah, did tell you the score, but not the answer yeah. specific yeah. to. So we could could do probably a short session to show that at some point. Yeah, so yeah. 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 Yeah